Hi everyone, welcome to session seven of our new foundation series. This is a series that originally took place on Saturday, December 12th, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. However, because of COVID uh, and a second lockdown, we couldn't gather with people in person. So we're re-recording or perhaps recording for the first time. And so we're coming to you from the middle of February. So some time has passed and some things have happened. Today's topic is moving forward. So we're, in a sense, looking back to the invitation to move forward. And as in all things, our movement, our activity in, in what we do in the church is rooted in prayer. So I'd like to invite Father Rod Belford to come and to lead us in an opening prayer. Dear brothers and sisters, um, let us take a moment as we consider the conversation that we're part of, let us take a moment now to pray, pray for our parish and to pray especially for unity in the parish, unity around what we are called to be. Uh, this prayer was written in the spring, long before Father James came, but you'll see there are common themes in the midst of all of this uh, that predate Father James. In fact, it uh, goes right back to the heart of our faith. So let us take a moment now, quiet in our hearts, and prepare to pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly ask that by your grace, our hearts are joined together in worship, in love and in service to build one new vibrant community of faith. Open our eyes to see this time of transition as an invitation to deepen in our reliance on you. Help us to pray, Lord, help us to listen and to act in a way that models how your son prayed, listened, and acted. Surround us with courage and wisdom, courage and wisdom to accept the new possibilities as we offer the gifts you have given each of us through baptism. Grant us peace, Lord. Grant us healing and understanding as we discern your will and make the necessary decisions to become a more missionary church of Christian disciples. We ask all this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Quickly, we want to just look back. We're talking about looking forward, don't we? Just want to look back as to where we've been. This is the seventh and final session of the seven week series. Uh, the very first week, we looked at the question of where are we presently? What, we looked at our, our vitals, the vital, uh, vital statistics. Uh, then we looked at where we've been called by scripture, by, by, the, by the leadership of the church. And we try to connect in with that calling through our, our dream about our parish, about the future of our parish. And then we looked at the call to repentance, to, to change our minds, to change our way of thinking about our church so that we could be free to move into the present. Then the last two weeks, we looked at our resources. Uh, week five, we looked at our human resources in terms of the spiritual gifts and how we can un unleash and unlock those gifts within our community. And last week, we looked at our physical and financial resources. Finally, we're looking at the question of moving forward. Now, before we move forward uh, into 2021, I wanna take some time with you to look back on on what happened in our parish between August and December when I, when I arrived as a pastor in August. The first thing I learned in all of this is that taking over a parish during a pandemic is not a good idea. You see, I used to always be really good with faces and not so good with names. Now I just feel like I'm bad at everything because I mean, you, well, you know what I'm saying. This is a difficult time and the normal ways and means by which I would establish relationships with people and, and seek to build trust were removed. They were taken away from us. And also there were some immediate and difficult decisions that had to be made that, that, were, that were quite dif difficult because we are, I believe, in multiple levels of crisis. We talked about this in the, in the earlier sessions. You know, we had the crisis that's been unfolding for the last 10, 20 or more years of the decline and then the, the crisis of the, of the sudden amalgamation of four parishes and then COVID-19. So what did we put in place? The number one thing, 
I think was the, the prayer foundation. Two things symbolize that prayer foundation for me. One was the invitation uh, that, that some of you took up in the early weeks when I arrived during the summer to, to walk the streets of our parish, to walk the streets of our neighborhood and to go out and to pray, uh, to ask the Lord to open our eyes to the people on the outside. Because sometimes we can be so fixated about ourselves that again, this is part of the conversion that needs to happen. Lord, let me have eyes to see those on, on the outside. And so I invited people to go and walk the streets and to pray and possibly to pray the rosary. And another thing we did is, is write a series, uh, a series of rosary meditations that are specifically focused on the question of parish renewal and parish transformation. So these are, this is one of the things that, that we did uh, going forward. We're still working on this to, to strengthen this prayer foundation. The second thing was to establish a proper base of operations. When I first arrived in August, we still had uh, some elements of administration records and such at the different locations we had to centralize. We had had some shift in staffing already because Sherry, who had been the, uh, the parish secretary, hadn't, hadn't been uh, operating in that role for several months before I arrived. She had moved to simply being the bookkeeper, so there was no parish secretary. We also had um, an, uh, an office that, that, that I think needed some work. There were some safety concerns with a, a very old carpet uh, and, and it, the office was just not a welcoming place. We had computers that were 15, 16 years old that couldn't do Wi-Fi. We had to fix the Wi-Fi system. In a sense, it seemed to me that we needed to invest in creating a base of operations and giving our core staff the tools they needed to do the job. That had to be the starting point and thanks be to God we were able to achieve that and, and make the office a safe place and a welcoming place for volunteers and for parishioners. The third task was to redirect resources. We had a challenge that, that the investment in parish staff that remained in August was very much that which was in place for a reality that had previously existed. So uh, it wasn't in one way recognizing the fact that we had amalgamated four parishes that we now had 11 buildings and the complexity of, of, those, of all those details of those buildings and all that administration was, was on the shoulders of a few people. Also, we had to face the fact that, you know, uh, in terms of liturgy, we were in lockdown. We had just come out of lockdown. We still weren't able to have music. And so we had to make some, some difficult decisions. We also had a staff member who was going on, on um, maternity leave and her role uh, some of what she did in terms of catechesis and faith formation was not going to be uh, of, of, of use to us during, during a pandemic. And so what were our areas of need? Uh, one was communications, because I think even in normal circumstances, parishes need to invest heavily in communications, especially in our new digital age, let alone during a time of pandemic. This made it all the more important. Uh, and so we, we looked at um, moving one of those positions. So uh, Lydia, who was going on leave, we effectively replaced her position by a communications person. And then uh, with, the, with the two other staff members in music and liturgy and maintenance, uh, we, we, we ended those positions. And in a sense, we, we rolled them together to create a new position called uh, Director of Operations. And that was uh, a long process for us to get those two hirings, which we did by early December. And as I come to you by mid-February, I, I can only tell you that it's been an absolute blessing for us. Get unusual circumstances, but, but all very much necessary in these changed circumstances. Uh, the fourth challenge for us was financial clarity because when I arrived in August, there was, we still didn't have the, the accounting systems of the four locations fully merged. That's a very, it was a very complicated thing, very challenging because each location had a different, a slightly different practice. And we, we were able to achieve that by end of December. We, as we've reported last week, we had clarity until the end of October financially. And um, we were able to merge together those, those systems and to finally get a sense of where we were. Fifthly was to, to reboot music ministry. We finally got the go ahead towards the end of October, I believe it was, from the province and from the archdiocese that we could reintroduce music with social distancing. And I had a conviction that we could reach out to parishioners and to, to volunteer musicians 
to begin to provide music for liturgies. And that's what we've begun to do. We've begun to, begun to build on that. Different people have stepped forward and, and offered their, their, their gifts to us. Uh, it may be, honestly, many years before we'll be in a place as a parish where we can invest uh, parish resources in a staffing position uh, to support this, this, this kind of ministry. But for now, we need to uh, call forth the gifts of the community. Number six was the challenge to rebuild weekend liturgies. We had a, a limit, you know, when I, we first arrived in August, we had just restarted parish masses. We were getting just over 200 people at weekend masses. We slowly grew those numbers until uh, the second lockdown. We grew them to about 430 people. We're now out of the second lockdown. We have a limit of 100 people. We're, we're, we're heading upwards again, but that's, that's a bit of a dance as we continue to to manage the consequences of, of the rate of infection uh, within our province. But we're trying to engage people in person and, number seven, also online. Because one of the things that we were able to do was to fund and install uh, an, an entire new audiovisual system. So the original uh, sound system in this church from 1969 was still in place. It, 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 was, the, it was a very innovative uh, system at the time. The speakers were in the lights. And, uh, but mu for music and such, it was very, very limited. So we have a, a three-part audiovisual system. We have a new, new speaker system with monitors, with, uh, with great uh, microphones, a monitoring system with, with, uh, with a sound mixer. And it's, you can mix it remotely from an iPad. It's, it's very state-of-the-art. We also have uh, three uh, large screen LCD uh, TVs for slides. We have a camera system, a robotic camera system for live streaming, and we converted one of the confessionals into a tech booth. And uh, we've since then recruited volunteers uh, to run slides, to run cameras, and you just have to check out our, our weekend um, live streaming to see that that's been a major, major blessing for us. Uh, number eight, we address major infrastructure issues. The, there were limited things we can do because to make long-term decisions about our buildings, or about all the buildings we've got, it's going to take time. Uh, number one, it's going to take time because we have to, we can't do it piecemeal. We've got to do our homework, as we talked about last week, do our research and make informed decisions. There's also a process uh, through canon law, through church law, that, that we're required to follow uh, in in coordination with the Archbishop and the Council of Priests when it comes to the closing of buildings. So that is going to be a process. The challenge for us though is it, we, kept, we could not simply keep spending the kind of money we'd been spending on these buildings. We showed during week one of the series that in January 2020 alone, we spent over $16,000 on heating uh, for nine of the 11 buildings for which we are responsible. And so Part of the decision around infrastructure was to winterize the locations of Immaculate Conception and St. Paul's. Uh, we were able to uh, winterize St. Paul's location and Immaculate Conception Church uh, by the beginning of November. Because of a, of a tenant who was living in Immaculate Conception Rectory, we had to wait towards the end of December before we winterized that building because we, we were helping that person move and find, and find a new home. And so, but that's been done. The other thing we did is we sought to change the locks in, in, the in all four properties. So, you know, it's a bit of work, uh, but it's done and we have a whole master key system uh, for, the, for the entire property. The ninth uh, thing that happened in the, that time was, was unforeseen by us. We had had a dream that the, the North End uh, location of St. Anthony's could be a center of outreach to the poor. And we, we heard news that the First Baptist Food Bank wanted to contact us to see if we would rent the St. Anthony's Hall for the operation of their food bank. And that, to the leadership team, just seemed not, it just didn't seem to make sense. How can we, how sh could we as a church charge another church money to serve the poor? It just seemed wrong. And so our response to the leaders of the food bank was, no, we will not rent our building to you, but we'll give it to you if you allow us to do it with you, help us to do it together. And so we had a number of meetings and although it was, it was very, we moved on this fairly quickly, uh, I have to say, but it just seemed that 
there was an urgency to it that this was a, a God moment and, and the leadership of First Baptist Church felt the same way as well and those involved in, in, in this enterprise because most of, their, of the people they served came from North End Dartmouth. And so we went ahead, we, we did some renovation work to the hall, cost a few bucks. I, I think we'll be blessed in the, in the long run though because now we have a, the, what is now called the North, Christian, the North Dartmouth Christian Food Bank and uh, more to come on that development uh, as we go forward. And finally was the found new foundation series uh, the seventh and final talk you're watching right now. But I, that was a, a major undertaking to bring close to 130, 140 people through this process. We had in-person meetings. We had people gathering on Zoom in the in-person meetings. We had these presentations you're watching, plus a time of prayer, a Eucharistic adoration, time of reflection. On the online sessions, we were able to often break into small groups for people to discuss. So we did our best during this time of pandemic to, and to be as creative as possible uh, to bring people together to look essentially at where have we been going and where are we called to go and where is it that we are going to go. You know, in the early weeks of these gatherings, you know, at times there were a few parishioners who just seemed to be chomping at the bit, like, like let's just tell us what to do and let's just go do it. And I think that, well, I like this, this quote by uh, the author Antoine de saint Osprey, who said this, if you want to build a ship, don't summon people to buy wood, prepare tools, distribute jobs and organize the work. Rather, teach people the yearning for the wide, boundless ocean. You see, I think that's where it begins we need to be taught to yearn for the wide boundless ocean. We need to begin to reimagine a future, uh, a, a God vision, a God size vision for our future. Um, and only when our imagination and our heart is awakened with a, with a sense of calling towards that destination do we begin to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Well, guess what? Well, hopefully through this New Foundation series as we move through this, this time where we engage the mind and the, the soul and the will and the, and the heart, hopefully you're ready to roll up your sleeves and, and get to work, to get the wood and the nails. We remember this slide that I showed in the last session. If you love the form, you have everything to lose. If you love what gives it its form, you're free to receive whatever it's turning into. I'm excited, dear friends, for what this whole thing is turning into. We're, we're still going through a difficult time. There's, there's still grieving to go through as we let go, as we, as we surrender that which God is calling us to surrender. But remember, we're doing so for the sake of something new because it's not just being lost, it's turning into something. And I look forward to the coming years as we journey together to discover what that is. Speaking of journeying together, I'd like to invite my friend, uh, Father Rob, who's, who's uh, going to share a little bit with you about his experience of this journey and his hope for the future. Uh, Father Rob. Thanks, Father James. You know, we're in such an interesting part, uh, an, in an interesting time in our history. We literally have a blank canvas ahead of us. And there is so much opportunity for us to consider what we want our parish to look like what we want our parish to be in moving forward. And one thing I can guarantee you in moving forward is I don't want a church built on Rob Elford. And I can say that I don't want a church built on James Mallon or the chair of any committee here. I want a church that, that's built on Jesus, this penniless field preacher from Galilee who changes everything. I'm reminded of a quote from a, a Jesuit by the name of Karl Rahner. He, he wrote, in the days ahead, you will either be a mystic or nothing at all. And he went on to explain that a mystic is one who has experienced God for real. So what do I want? What do I want for this parish? Well, I hope, I want a church, I, 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 I want a church where people have experienced the grace-filled transformational touch of God. Because I know that when God touches you, God will also send you. 
And where will God send you? Well, he, throughout history, he sent people into the ordinary routine of our lives to transform our home environments, to transform our approach to work, where people will get to see, even if you don't change your jobs, you don't have to change your job because you've become a Christian, but where people will see the authentic joy through you and will be attracted, it will be provocative. Why? Where does this joy come from? Where does this sense of integrity that this man come, where, where does he get this from? Um, our Lord is going to send people to show mercy and kindness and compassion to the homeless, to the addicts. Uh, he's going to send people to visit. We have, a, we have a jail and three halfway houses inside of our parish. I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus is calling people to show compassion to these folks, either in prison or reintegrating back in the community. I have no doubt in my mind that Jesus is going to be sending people to be with people suffering from all sorts of traumas they've, they've experienced in life. The hurting, the vulnerable, the isolated, the sick, the dying. Then, then, when Jesus calls, when we have experienced his touch, when we come to rely on our mystical sense of ourselves, our mystical, our desire to be in, in communion with God, then we will know what the church is. Then liturgy and mission will be a hand-in-hand -hand product that will express the joyful sense of community, that we will yearn to come to Mass, we will yearn to receive the Blessed Sacrament, then we will know the joy of simply being a human being fully alive in faith, hope, and love. Yeah, so that's the church I want to be part of. That's the church called to know our Lord more intimately and he who calls us on mission. Thanks for listening. So thank you, Father Rob. Now, remember this talk originally was given on December 12th, looking at 2021. I'm coming to you. It's the middle of February, 2021 is well underway. But I reviewed these, these slides that are coming and thought, I don't really need to change anything because it's still, it's still accurate. So I wanna to talk to you about moving forward into 2021. And before we get into specifics, I just want to remind you of the epic journey the epic journey that we're called. We're being called to, to move from where we are to where God is calling us to be. And wouldn't it be wonderful if that's what it looked like? We had constant progress, moving in the right direction and moving on and moving upward. Unfortunately, that's not how it goes in real life. In real life, it goes like this. Yep. So uh, we're, remember, at the very beginning of this journey. So if you look at this, this line, um, it, we've got hard work ahead of us. Um, there's some, in some ways, things can get a lot worse before they start getting better. But this is like every epic journey begins this way. And this is what God is calling us to do. So as we launch out in this journey, I want to share with you 10 priorities that um, I've discerned with the leadership team that lie ahead of us in the coming year, or at least until the summer. I'm going to see if we can get all this stuff done. The first is liturgical ministries. We've brought together four different communities with four different sets of practices. We still have a lot of inconsistencies in how we do it. We just want to bring uh, clarity to, to how we do things together. And we want to get greater organization the, uh, to, to our different liturgical ministries. And that includes forming a liturgy committee and, and defining the different roles and, and creating a plan for training. So all of that is, is actually, it's happening. Already had a first meeting of a liturgy committee and that's uh, in process. The second one is improving preaching. I love listening to Father Rob preach. I'm not so sure about that other guy there, but here's my conviction is, is that we've got to invest in our preaching. It's, it's the reason why some of you may have noticed that Father Rob and I take a turn each week. Only one of us preaches in any given week is because when you're preaching every single week, you're giving two different homilies. Not only is sometimes the, our parishioners getting two different messages, but think of, 
think of the work, the energy that goes into doing that. And imagine if we can put double the energy into any one homily, therefore preach every second week. That's what we've been doing. A parishioner last week uh, mentioned to me, said, Father James, we've noticed that you guys put a lot of work into your homilies, and we do. We meet ahead of time. Uh, we talk together about what we sense God calling us to communicate. Uh, we, we, we meet with each other. We give each other uh, feedback on it, on our preaching. We sometimes make adjustments and we do follow-up evaluation as well, as well as during the season of Lent coming up, we're planning a preaching series that we planned uh, a, a number of weeks ago. So a lot more work going into preaching. I think preaching is an incredibly, an incredibly important part of our journey ahead. Uh, the third challenge ahead of us between now and June is what I outlined in the last session of New Foundations in session six is that our options committee have to do their homework. We've got a lot of work. We want to research these four options. Remember, sell everything, uh, just repair the St. Peter's location, upgrade the, and repair the St. Peter's location, uh, or, or build a brand, new, a brand new building. We've got to do a, a lot of homework in order to begin to clearly see what might be the best options for us. And we're hoping to get that done by June. Uh, another one is to refound the parish pastoral council. And I'm pleased to say that we made invitations to, from among the people who, who came to be a part of our new foundation series. And as I speak to you this coming week, we're having a meeting uh, and inviting people into a discernment process uh, we're going to give information about this new shape of parish pastoral council. It's not going to be like the, the pastoral councils of old. It's not a management uh, committee. It's a strategically focused group that's, go that's going to be looking at the next four or five years, really building our, 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 our future. So please pray for that. That's underway to refound the parish pastoral council. The next challenge is to renew uh, the finance council and the building committees, uh, this is underway. Again, we're hoping to draw people who are involved in this series. Uh, we're gonna need, we're, we do need some, a few more people on the Finance Council and we're trying to resurrect the building committee because although this, that committee will not so much be concerned about discerning and researching the future, uh, it's about managing our present. And trust me, with all of the buildings we've got, we need your help. So if you have, if you've got skill or interest in, in helping us to manage buildings, please, please, we do need your help. Uh, number six, to prepare and launch an online alpha. We spoke about this about a month ago that we're planning uh, after Easter to launch what's called an alpha taster. It's not going to be real alpha because we're not inviting people on the outside of the church because remember, alpha is a fishing tool. It's not a tool to feed sheep. But as we do it just for ourselves, as an alpha taster, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna learn how to use it. And we will be spiritually renewed. We will be blessed. We will develop friendships and grow in community as a parish. And don't we really need that? So that's planned for after Easter. Well, I've already started to meet with the team. It's underway. Number seven is to reach out and bring people back. The truth is that between the amalgamation and the pandemic and then in your new pastor in making some difficult decisions, there's a few sheep who are a little, feeling a little excluded or feeling a little upset or maybe greatly upset. And while, you know, we respect that and how people feel, um, we also want to seek to reach out to people and try to bring people back. And I understand if people just feel like, no, I've moved on, I'm, I'm, I've, I've joined another parish, then that's fine. But we're trying to mobilize. We've got a committee up and running that's going to, that's got a, developing a plan to reach out uh, and try to bring people back or even to reach out to people who have been, who are isolated uh, because of the pandemic uh, and, to, and to reach out to them. Uh, we talked about prayer in this in the first part when we look back, but as we look ahead, we want to broaden the prayer foundation. We're entering the season of Lent. It's a great opportunity to do just that. Uh, we are having a number of, of initiatives for prayer starting in the next week or so, but we want to broaden that as a ministry of intercession for us going into the future because we're talking about building the future, laying the new foundation for a new future, and we've got to continue to, to base that on prayer. The ninth one is to form small study groups 
And this actually dovetails nicely with, with the prayer theme because the first uh, initiative that we're doing is coming up next week during Lent. It's the prayer workshop, the five week prayer workshop that we're planning. So that's our first uh, initiative and in, in starting to do a faith formation with, with adults for now. Eventually we want to uh, be able to develop a new system of faith formation of catechesis, not just for adults, but for youth and for children, including uh, working with families for sacramental preparation. But all of that to come, you know, we just, as, as much as we're doing, it's, it's, uh, we can't do everything at once. It's go all of this is going to take time. And finally is shaping our outreach to the poor. I shared with you how we had developed a partnership with First Baptist for the North Dartmouth Christian Food Bank, but we're still at the beginning of that process. We, we want to set up a, a steering committee and have parishioners serve on that steering committee. We also want to eventually look at how we can get volunteers involved in serving through the food bank. But the food bank is just one thing. I mean, we've got parishioners who do tremendous work in ministry through St. Vincent de Paul uh, at, at several of our locations, especially here at the, the St. Peter's location with our own little mini food bank that we have. Also, we've got the parishioners who bring food uh, to Margaret House. Uh, we have uh, quite a number of initiatives. We've got a refugee committee. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen. And one of the things I'm hoping to do, we've, we've looked at this for after Easter, is to gather together all of our parishioners who are involved in outreach to the poor to, in a sense, um, help us to get clarity on what it is that we do and, and then come together to say, okay, let's develop a plan. How do we move forward in all of this? So those are the, the goals that I'm hoping to achieve before summer. And as I review these with you, I'm thinking by the time June hits, I might be looking for a little vacation time. I don't know about you. I feel a little exhausted already just, just telling you all this. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a stretch to do this, but it's not impossible. And I'm looking forward to seeing if we, if we can get this done. I want to pause now and invite Dr. David Dean to come and share a few thoughts with you. To think about using our gifts in the service of parish renewal is to think about, in my opinion, two things. One, the fact that nothing can happen without the operation of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. The Holy Spirit is the first thing necessary for us to get where we, where we need to go. The second thing qualifies that affraction. It emphasizes the fact that the Holy Spirit doesn't control us like some form of demonic possession. It doesn't zap us and turn us into robots. Rather, the Holy Spirit works with our natural gifts. The Holy Spirit, who is grace itself, for Catholics, can be refused. And this is important if we're to realize that we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Now, to frame this, I'm going to focus on one particular moment in the life of the church, a moment in the life of the church which I think resonates with where we are now. I want to speak about Pentecost, about the upper room, and about what happens as the Holy Spirit drives the apostles out to make disciples of all nations. Remember, the upper room is a terrifying place. People have followed, the disciples have followed Jesus Christ to Jerusalem. And we know from both scripture, tradition, and history that many are expecting, well, some are expecting the return of the Davidic monarchy. Some are expecting the overthrow of the Roman Empire and the liberation of Judea. They're expecting Jesus Christ to be a king like other kings. And what happens is brutal. What happens is the death of Jesus Christ, not just any death. Crucifixion is a death designed not just to kill the person, but to kill everything the person represents, to kill all the hope associated with the person. It emphasizes mocking, debasement, and brutal violence. And what happens? Well, Jesus' followers deny him. Peter denies Jesus. When we read the story of the, the road to Emmaus in, in, in Luke, 
These are people going to a mass from Jerusalem. They're getting out of Dodge. What happens is the Christian community scatters in fear and trembling. It's very difficult to get a sense of how the Roman world or how the broader society would have seen this early Christian community. But think about the most reviled, reprehensible, lowly, degenerate people you can think of. That's how these, this, this group would have been seen at the time. The chances of that group being part of a movement that changed the world was zero. And yet that's exactly what happened. Within four centuries, the Western world was well on the way to becoming Christian from this frightened, broken, terrified rabble. How did, how did it change? Well, if, if we're to pay attention to Scripture, if we're to pay attention to the book of Acts, we know that it changes at Pentecost. It changes when the church is gathered in the upper room, terrified and frightened. And what happens is the Holy Spirit descends upon them. Now, this is really, really important. The Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles, and in response to this activity of the Holy Spirit, they go out. Now, bear with me for a second while I try and draw a picture of this, because words I don't think, you know, they don't really do enough to capture what's actually happening here. They don't do enough to capture how we relate to the Holy Spirit. Think about it if you can in colors. I'm here um, surrounded by stained glass windows that try, and, that try and tell these stories through colors. And so inspired by these windows, I'll try and do likewise. If you can picture these apostles in the upper room, they're people just like you and me. And if you can picture them as color, picture them as, you know, white, with maybe a little bit of yellow, that sort of the, 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 like the white is a kind of, you know, not of God, but there's a little bit of yellow, a little bit of image and likeness of God. And the Holy Spirit descends on them. And this white and yellow becomes, becomes conformed to orange as the Holy Spirit billows through their bodies. Jesus Christ is red. And so they become conformed to Christ, not simply at the moment that the Holy Spirit enters their bodies, they become conformed to Christ. They become like Christ when, in response to the activity of the Holy Spirit, they go out. So that movement from white with a little bit of yellow to orange by the Holy Spirit to red like Jesus Christ when they go out and act like Christ and speak like Christ. Now, why, why do I want to use colors? I want to use colors to get a sense of, of, the, of the relationship with Jesus Christ that we cooperate in but also because what happens at Pentecost is, I think, better understood as, as the sharing of a virus, the sharing of something, the sharing of that color, rather than the use of particular words or particular alchemies. They have become infected by the Holy Spirit. They've become infected by Jesus Christ, and they go out and they proclaim, they spread this relationship with the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. They spread it not because they know the precise words and formulations, that they know the precise phrases which can win hearts and minds, but because they're infected and therefore they're infectious. The Holy Spirit who is faith and hope and love, Jesus Christ who is the Word itself, who is the good news incarnate, they become conformed to the Holy Spirit, conformed to Christ, and therefore everybody, the text says, hears them in their own language. Everybody comes to encounter the Word, Jesus Christ, through whatever words, and I'm not sure these words matter too much, whatever words are being said. There's a movement of the Holy Spirit, but this movement of the Holy Spirit is accepted by these frightened people in the upper room. The Holy Spirit gives them faith and hope and love, and they respond to that by being Christ-like in going out. So that's the first thing I want to, and the most important thing. Our gifts 
are gifts from the Holy Spirit. They're gifts of the Holy Spirit. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, we spread the word, who is Jesus Christ himself. We spread an encounter with Jesus Christ himself. But the other thing to note, and this is important to note, think about people like St. Paul, think about St. Peter, think about St. Therese, think about St. Francis, think about all these people. When the Holy Spirit, when that Holy Spirit infuses their body, remember Romans 8, 11, when the Spirit of He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal body, when the Spirit dwells in their bodies, they are raised up in accordance with their gifts, with their natural gifts, with who they are. You might remember last week or the week before, we were looking at, at various you know, ministerial tests, trying to find out who we are. And on the basis of who we are, we can come to know what we're called to do. Theologian Henri de Lubac talks about this in his book on the mystery of the supernatural. He says, it's more like the way an apple comes to an apple tree. Right outside now, we see these dead trees, dead clumps of wood. And in September, an apple will come to these dead, lifeless branches. Note, an apple, not a 2005 Nissan Micra, because that's not in the apple tree's nature. Apples give rise to apple trees. Who are you? Who are we? What do we have? What happens when the Holy Spirit permeates our bodies? What happens when the Holy Spirit rests on the bodies of women and men in this place, in Our Lady of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Parish in Dartmouth? That's what we're discerning. That's what we're thinking about. That's what we're asking ourselves as a parish, but also you as a person. Where are your gifts? Are they in shepherding? Are these gifts in, in, in proclamation? Are they evangelical? Are they organizational? We looked at these in the past. Because when the Holy Spirit, this orange permeates your body, then you'll be conformed to Christ, that red thing, in accordance with your gifts. The apostles go out and are conformed to him in terms of discipleship. The question you've got to answer is how will you be conformed? to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Again, I just want to remind you of that quote about yearning for the wide, boundless ocean and not rushing to, to summon people to buy wood and prepare tools. But guess what? Now we want to, enough with the yearning. <laughs> now we want you to start thinking about buying wood and buying tools. And it, the, the tasks that, we, that I presented on as we look ahead until June, they fall into general categories. One is, is strategic, and those are the kind of tasks that have to do with th creating a plan for our future. There are financial issues around uh, you know, our need to look at financial elements of our plan and also to repopulate our finance council. There are shepherding issues. So perhaps you know, if you're a person who's concerned about the people who have been left behind, the people who have been excluded or forgotten, then you might have a shepherding gift that you might be able to help us with. Another is prayer. You might be a parishioner uh, that, that you may sense that your contribution to this whole enterprise might simply be to, to pray, to intercede, or to help and invite others to pray and intercede. Then there's the poor. Perhaps out of all of these things I've spoken about, what speaks to your heart the most is, is yeah, don't forget the poor. Uh, that's what I would like to be involved in. Or evangelization, we're looking at Alpha and mobilizing our whole parish to be an evangelizing, welcoming church. And perhaps that's something that speaks to your heart. Finally, teaching. Some of you have, have gifts to teach and that could be a real help for us as we plan uh, catechesis going forward, a new model of catechesis. The Archbishop is asking us to look at that as well. In fact, it's very interesting. The Archbishop has, has given us four priorities going forward. Number one is evangelization. He's asked us to, every parish, to choose and implement a tool for evangelization. Number two, to look at the question of homelessness and the poor. Number three, parish identity and unity. And number four, uh, a new model of, of catechesis for adults, youth, and children. So I think we're right on point. In week five, we looked at the question of charisms. And we looked at Ephesians 4 and how some people have, uh, there's the, the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. And the point is that these gifts 
are distributed amongst the people of God. And as you're watching this video today, some of you are going to be, you have apostolic gifting. So you, it, that means that you're, you're, you want to th not only think about the future, you want to mo mobilize and move us into the future. You might be interested in some of the strategic tasks that we have to undertake. Uh, for those of you with a prophetic charism, you may either be called to, be, to commit to pray, to praying for our parish and grounding everything in prayer and calling our parish to prayer. Or uh, often people who have a prophetic calling are very passionate about justice in, in, in serving the poor. And so that might be an area that you're called to. An evangelist, obviously, that might be something in terms of helping our parish be welcoming and be outward focused and getting involved in helping us to get Alpha going. Uh, shepherding, you know, helping to draw people in to be the arms of the parish and teacher, again, helping us to get a new model of catechesis up and running. I'm hoping that for all of you watching today, that all of you will feel uh, a prompting in your hearts to get involved and help us do this. I've presented a lot of things. We've presented a lot of things here. Guess what? Father Rob and myself are going to look really silly trying to do this by ourselves. We need you to step forward. And so uh, this work, this talk was originally given, as you know, on December 12th. We have since then begun to meet with some of the, we originally broke out into work groups uh, uh, and we've begun to have meetings with some of those groups, but it's not too late for you to also get involved. And so just a few questions for reflection for you, or just one question really. What are the three things that resonate most in your heart? Again, please take this to prayer. I, I want to mention, invite you to pray with the rosary meditation as you continue to pray for the renewal of our parish. Thank you for being with us, not only in this session, but in all seven sessions. Please uh, share this video with, uh, with your fellow parishioners, and let's continue to, to ask the Lord to, to give us hope as we move into the future during these challenging times. Thank you and God bless.